Thank you, Jerry. I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God." Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, may you use this time and speak to our hearts and give us understanding in these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last number of weeks I've presented biblical truth that is intended to shape the Christian mindset, truths that transform, of finding peace in Christ, not being dependent on government provision, but ultimately on the God who provides, asking the Lord to divinely intervene and stop this virus, be it all through answered prayer, a miracle, or a scientific breakthrough. And I've touched on topics about Believers being raised in Christ, believers being seated in Christ, being justified in Christ, having the mindset of Christ, and finding spiritual rest in Christ. Today we're going to explore what it means to be strengthened in the inner person in Christ. In a simple to understand way, this actually happens when we simply take God's word at face value. We accept the truth that the scriptures are the word of God. We accept that they came from the heart and the mind of God. We accept that these truths and principles in Holy Scripture are infallible, that they're eternal and they transcend time and culture. Now, obviously, the process of being transformed in the inner man is way more complex. But in keeping it simple, we start with Christ and the message of the cross, and his resurrection from the dead, we respond personally to this message by asking the Lord into our hearts, and we tell him that we believe. And we end with eternal forgiveness, eternal salvation, eternal hope, and eternal glory. This is the spiritual movement of the scriptures from start to finish. It starts with Christ and it ends with Christ. This is the gospel of Christ. And so as this spiritual process unfolds, the transformation in the inner person is a renovation of the heart into the likeness of Christ. In using a building analogy, we get a new foundation, a new structural support. It's akin to becoming a new creation in Christ. But then the spiritual renovation of the rooms begins, so to speak, and God methodically begins the makeover in our thought process. Our spiritual thought process is huge, especially during trying times and times of uncertainty. Now, someone more recently pointed out to me that there is nothing uncertain about this time because God knows it all. Amen to that. But it can be a challenging time in our thought process because we don't know what happens for tomorrow. So case in point, trying times. Statistics are up when it comes to people not coping. Just the other night I saw on the news, mental and emotional breakdowns are on the rise. Suicides are increasing and projected to continue to increase. Depression is on the rise. Now I want you to stop and think about how God makes all the difference in your life so you don't go there. God strengthens your inner person. 
Uh, this is a very, very relevant message during the corona lockdown and the, the demand for social distancing. Now, my son was telling me of a situation where he not watched a news segment and one of the participants spoke of the area of the brain that is actually known as the social brain. And it's wired for human interaction and stimulation. And as I understand it, that is necessary and critical for human survival and human interaction socially. We need to interact with other people. We're social beings. So during the interview, Concern was expressed that many people are being deprived of social activity and interaction during this lockdown. That's why the emotional breakdowns are up, uh, the mental issues are occurring, and people are committing suicide. They're, they're, they're at a loss. Uh, this is a legitimate concern. And I might add, some medical experts have actually indicated that there is virtually no indication statistically that social distancing is actually making a difference in the number of coronavirus cases. Uh, just the other day, New York State reported that most of their new cases, and I stress new, uh, are coming from people who were following the social distancing and staying at home. So if this is true, then social distancing is not having the intended effect that authorities had hoped and keep hoping for. And so therefore it also raises the question, what kind of emotional and psychological damage is being inflicted on people who are quarantined and socially distanced for a very long time from others? Now, I'm obviously thinking of many people, but I'm especially thinking of the elderly. And this is just one group in our society what about our very young who depend on social interaction to develop emotionally and mentally? What about those who are working through mental and emotional issues and depend on others for support? What about those who are trying to beat addiction and are typically very dependent on group meetings and meeting with others? And the group list could go on and on. And what about moms on Mother's Day? Uh, this is certainly not going to be a normal Mother's Day for many moms. Uh, lots of moms are going to be isolated in nursing homes. And many are not celebrating a holiday that typically involves a time of sharing, a time of visitation. It's forbidden. And especially for those who reside in nursing homes. And many will not be able to take their mom out annually to the restaurants, as is their custom. And then in addition to add salt to the wound, how many moms are grieving over the loss of loved ones, be it virus-related or other causes? We ought to be very, very concerned about what this social lockdown is doing psychologically and mentally and emotionally to our people. Uh, we know that it is devastating financially. We can see the unemployment numbers weekly. We are hearing stories questioning whether small businesses will be able to reopen or even survive in the months ahead. And then what about the long-term psychological effects? This is where having God in your life makes all the difference because the Holy Spirit strengthens your inner person in him. Now, as we look at this truth in scripture, I want to just set Ephesians chapter three in its context. Ephesians is known as a heavenly epistle. And in chapter one, the apostle Paul talks about how the believers have this standing in Christ in heavenly places. They've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Chapter two, both Jew and Gentile are brought under one roof, which we call the church. And in chapter three, the apostle Paul explains that God unfolded this mystery to him by way of direct revelation. And this, is, this mystery is shared in scripture that the Gentiles can now share and participate in the spiritual riches and the inheritance of Israel. It means 
that Gentiles have been included in these spiritual promises made to Abraham and to his seed. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. And so prior to this revelation, salvation was exclusively uh, and collectively forbidden within the Gentile nations. It only, salvation only happened if a Gentile converted to Judaism. For example, Rahab or Ruth, uh, Gentiles, and they became believers in the God of the Old Testament. So therefore, Gentile believers are now fellow heirs and partakers as they participate and they respond to Christ and his promises. Now, this does not mean that the church unequivocally replaces Israel and the promises of God to the Jewish nation are null and void. Uh, on the contrary, if you read Romans chapter 9 through 11, it makes it abundantly clear that Gentiles have been grafted into this blessing. And the scripture says to the Jew first, salvation, and then to the Gentile. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. So what we want to do is we want to keep in mind that Christianity is a movement that has its roots in Judaism. And it extends back into the Old Testament scriptures that predicted the coming of Christ and giving us these promises in the church and bringing Gentiles into the salvation promises of God. Now, as the Apostle Paul seeks to share these truths with the saints in Ephesus, Paul prays this tremendous prayer of significance. And this prayer applies to every believer down through the ages. The, the prayer is that the church might be strengthened in the Holy Spirit, that Christ might dwell in the hearts by faith, that the church would be rooted and grounded in love, and that the church would comprehend and know the love of Christ. Folks, these, th this prayer, these truths are within the grasp of the church, every single believer in Christ. Now, today, what I want to do is I just want to focus on what it means to be strengthened in the inner man. First, as it pertains to the inner person, Paul wants every believer to know how rich they are in Christ Jesus. Paul's prayer is that we would understand this rich, richness that is commensurate to the glory and the power of Christ. In other words, if you can measure the glory and the power of Christ, which is an impossibility, but if you could, that's how rich you are and I am and every believer in Christ. It's an impossibility to measure such riches. And yet there is a way to measure being rich. Uh, people do this every day through paper money, gold, silver, the stock market, IRAs, 401ks, and all the stuff that we have. Buildings, houses, commercial boats, cars, planes, and the like. And, and yet, the believer is not to measure their richness or their wealth in this way. They are called upon to realize that Christ is their standard of richness. This richness is in the inner person to behold him, to consider him, to think on him, to embrace him in the richness of his power and his glory. This is the way to measure riches. This is God's standard of richness. It's having a relationship with Jesus. Now, now Paul's prayer here is that the believer would seek to understand this richness Verse 16, that he would grant to you and me an understanding according to the riches of his glory. According to the riches of his glory implies that Christ has a very, very spiritually deep reservoir of richness that we can come to, that we can draw from. This is what we've been given in Christ. His riches, the riches of his glory are unlimited in scope and they are unlimited in Holy Spirit power. 
And so Paul is speaking of this richness of Holy Spirit power when it comes to transforming our hearts. And each of us so desperately need to tap into that power and daily to drink from this spiritual reservoir in Christ and to drink daily. Now, how do we understand what Paul means by the inner person? Uh, this is how we are to understand it. The inner person is all that we are spiritually. It refers to our hearts, which represents the seed of our emotions, our intellect, and our will. It encompasses our personalities and our per personal consciousness. It incorporates our minds and our souls, our spirits and our thoughts. They're all brought into this idea of the inner person. Essentially, as someone said, the inner person is the center of our beings, all that makes us who and what we are. Now, I want you to think about that. But the inner person comp comprises an awful lot. That, an awful lot that most anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, uh, psycho uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, theologists, uh, that we all have a, um, uh, a limited understanding in all these things. In, in other words, we barely know how the human being is wired. And yet, because we're made in the image and likeness of God, because God has wired us, he's able to sort through it all if we let him. And so the inner person is the place where God does his work. It's the place where God strengthens. It's the place where the human will and human thought triggers and produces decisions. And decisions lead to actions. And actions give shape to reactions. And reactions give shape to other thoughts. And then the process goes over and over again. And what you can actually have is this big, tangled ball of spaghetti. Try to unravel that. Now, I want you to know it, but God can. I, I want you to notice that, that Paul speaks about being strengthened through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to emphasize the word through. Being strengthened through the Spirit means by the Spirit. The spiritual process does not allow for a spiritual strengthening apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to think about this, but whatever is not built on Christ Whatever is apart from Christ, it's going to be shaken. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us this. Once more, God will, shaken, will shake those things that can be shaken. Whatever is not built on Christ will be dismissed and be dismantled if it's not on a firm foundation. Matthew chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It will all be burned up if Life is not built on him. It will all come to ruin. So to be spiritually strengthened apart from Christ is to not be strengthened at all. It's an impossibility. It's a facade. It's spiritual fake news. It's a spiritual mirage. It's a misnomer. You cannot be strengthened apart from being strengthened in Christ. I know of a situation where a believer was given a book written by a mystic. Now, a mystic is a generally one who seeks uh, divine encounters apart from the revelation of Christ in Scripture. Uh, does the name Nostradamus ring a bell? Nostradamus was a mystic. Now, there are also mystics that call themselves Christian mystics. What they do is Besides the revelation of Christ in Scripture, they seek God in a spiritual way apart from the Bible. That's a topic for another time. But this book was written not by a Christian mystic, but it was written by a secular mystic for daily devotionals to spiritually help and strengthen people. Now, I kind of did some research on this book. It contains some spiritual truth about being kind and loving and thoughtful and good. 
but it also contains spiritual error. And so when you mix spiritual truths with spiritual error, how does that help? That's like mixing poison with a great meal. And it's devoid of the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ is never even mentioned in this book. It openly states that one's higher power can be anything you want it to be. Now, that should be a red flag when it comes to New Age thought, because it's displacing Christ and making your higher power be anything that you want it to be. Listen, something that is devoid of Christ means that it's also devoid of the Spirit of God, and it will not strengthen. Christ, the Scripture tells us, sent the Holy Spirit to minister the truth of Christ to our hearts, to minister the work of God upon our souls, and to minister a spiritual strengthening and a transformation where we are transformed and we become like him. We see like him spiritually and we think like him. I alluded to this several uh, times in recent weeks. Spiritual transformation does not come from the power of positive thinking. True spiritual transformation is not man-made. What is of man does not last. Spiritual strengthening doesn't come from a secular doctrine of kindness. It does not come from doing good works. Not that kindness and good works are wrong, but these are spiritual veneers on the soul that do not truly transform the inner person into the image and likeness of Christ. I can find an atheist who's doing good works and kind and good. The Spirit's work is lasting, it's transformational, it's biblical, it's truthful, it's a spiritual mindset, it is Christ-centered, it renovates the heart and the soul. He spiritually teaches us. He rejuvenates our souls. He renews our spirits and our hearts. He spiritually overwrites the garbage that can be up in the mind and the heart. He provides the spiritual makeover into something beautiful. The Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God and brings it to life. He reveals Christ. He establishes us in the grace and truth of Christ. He gives us spiritual stability in Christ. He shows us spiritual error. He reveals what is of God and what is not. And he quickens our spiritual senses. As I said just a minute ago, as we think like Christ, we also begin to spiritually see like Christ. Paul is telling the church here that the Holy Spirit power is found in abundance. It's found in your heart. It's found in Christ. If you have Christ in your heart, this power is within every believer. Now, let me see if I can somewhat illustrate this to you and give you a picture of, of what I think Paul was trying to communicate. Uh, there was a no-name Christian missionary to Egypt a couple hundred years ago. God transformed his life in Christ and gave him a spiritual burden for the lost. So he sails to Egypt. He ministers in the Middle East for 20 years, and he never saw one convert. He is buried in the shadows of the pyramids. His burial plot is postage stamp-like. He was buried with his Bible, and whatever he done had done in the name of Christ. And as you look at his grave plot, it's a sad and sorry-looking place to be buried. Sandy, soiled dirt with trash around, enclosed in a wrought iron fence next to, next to some run-down building in this back alley. But because his life is hidden in Christ, He's eternally rich as I speak. I want you to contrast this with the worldly glory of Pharaoh's tomb. 
Now, the worldly glory of the pyramid structures, as you know, they rise hundreds of feet off the face of the desert floor. And if you go into the, the king's chambers, as they call it, down into the pyramids, where the Pharaoh's tomb is contained, worldly riches surround and abound in these chambers because the Pharaohs were buried with their riches. Because they believed in the afterlife that all that worldly riches and all their worldly glory as Pharaoh would be theirs again in the afterlife. They believed that as they came to life in the afterlife, these inanimate objects would come to life and be their riches as well. They confused the temporal and the eternal, the worldly and the spiritual. And I would submit to you, this is what we do today. We seek to use that which is of man to accomplish the spiritual work of God. We make spiritual transformation about worldly quests. Self-realization, self-actuation, um, you know, self-esteem and self-worth uh, about what I have to do, about what I can do, about what I should do spiritually, rather than about what Christ is doing and what he wants to do. It does not scripture say that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the end of Christ, until the end of Christ Jesus? to the day of Christ Jesus. Spiritual transformation in the inner man or person happens when we let Christ and the power of, Holy, of, of his Holy Spirit just rise up and well up in our soul. That's the work that is hidden, that is buried, that is power. Paul speaks of this strengthening. Now, in the inner person, it, it may be helpful to, uh, uh, to, in grasping this, to contrast the difference between the outer person and the inner person. Uh, Paul does this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, the verse prior to the passage I read, Paul also sp spoke of the Ephesians not losing heart given the trials and the sufferings that Paul was going through. Their heart longed and yearned for him, and they suffered with him. This is very, very relevant to every Christian at any time, especially during this corona lockdown time. I want you, the outer man is decaying or perishing, and yet the inner person of the believer is being renewed daily. Now, we know that physical strengthening comes when one is physically active. We know that when a person runs, lifts weights, does aerobics, gets on a treadmill, uses a stationary bike, one gets physically stronger. But the reality is, is that there are times when the body struggles physically to engage this kind of activity. I want you to think about it. So there are, are physical restrictions at times. For example, one may not be able to exercise due to sickness. Maybe some can't exercise due to um, a bad knee, a sore foot, an achy back, or the sciatic nerve acting up. Maybe scheduling is an issue. Maybe motivation is an issue. Maybe medical conditions interfere with exercise. Maybe it's just an issue of old age. As people get older, age and physical limitations are issues. Now, this is not about making excuses. I'm trying to contrast the outer person to the inner person. And I'm not suggesting that wouldn't, one shouldn't try to stay in shape, or remain physically active, because our, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm just pointing out the reality that the, uh, that the outer person doesn't always have the ability to do. It's perishing. It gets weak. It gets tired. It gets sickly. 
This is why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, bodily discipline is only of little profit. That is, it helps for this life. But godliness, that inner transformation, is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and also the life to come. The Holy Spirit's work in the inner man is more lasting. It is not limited like the outer man. It is renewed daily, and it vastly differs from what is done in the inner person compared to the outer person. God's work in the inner person is not limited nor defined by physical barriers. That's the beauty of it. Uh, Jesus actually shared this truth with the woman at the well. He spoke of a living water that constantly bubbles up in the inner person unto eternal life. It also leads to daily spiritual renewal where one does not thirst spiritually. We also see this principle hold true in the Old Testament with Joseph. Remember when Joseph was physically imprisoned? God ministered to his heart and his spirit. Uh, and Genesis, uh, in Genesis, it tells us the Lord was with Joseph. He extended his kindness to him, and he gave him favor in the chief jailer's sight. Uh, verse 23 of chapter 39 in Genesis, the Lord made Joseph prosper. That is to say, he transformed his inner person where God gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Also in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were imprisoned for the gospel. And if you read the account, they were singing their heart outs. They were being renewed in the inner person. That is the work and the truth of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Also, the Apostle Paul uh, in Ephesians, he, uh, this is a prison epistle, and he's imprisoned. He's under house arrest. Well, in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Paul probably looked at a Roman soldier coming to serve him food and to see how he was adorned in his all his armor and that imagery spoke powerfully to what it means to be clothed in Christ and in the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Also in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is also under house arrest, and he spoke about being poured out like a drink offering to the glory of God because he understood the work of God in his inner heart and how God was even using him in prison during that time in a transformational way in his own life and in the lives of others that he would touch. Why is the work of the Holy Spirit in the inner person such an important principle to understand and take to heart? Because we are always going to find ourselves in trials and tribulations. Uh, Jesus said, I remind you in John chapter 16, verse 33, In the world you have tribulation. Take courage, I have overcome the world. And as I understand the work of God in our inner person, and this is how we understand it, we are able, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to work through disappointment, whether it be worldly or spiritual. Through his spirit, we're able to find comfort in God's presence and in God's word to rise above discouragement. We are given the mind of Christ to flip depression on its head. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, he brings us renewed hope in God. We are given the grace to confront our fears through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Spirit's help to corral anxiety. We have the mind of Christ so we do not spiritually faint and lose heart in the faith. It is his inner strength that gives us the spiritual ability to overcome 
and override mental and emotional weaknesses. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's certainly of the mind and the spirit. Because of him, we are not emotionally crushed in trying times. We may be perplexed, but we're not crushed. We embrace an overcoming Holy Spirit mindset. We stand firm in Christ, not letting the world or our sin keep us down. Uh, Paul wrote to the church in, in Col uh, uh, Colossae, Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. You are strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse, 17, uh, verse 7, Paul reminds Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of power. As I close, think about this. This same Holy Spirit power is the same Holy Spirit and the same Holy Spirit power that is hovering over the created order in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. This is the same Holy Spirit power and the same spirit, the same person that raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the same Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit power that resides in every believer that God might transform us and strengthen us in the image of Christ. So let me, let me sum up here. The Holy Spirit's work is done in the inner person. It is not of a worldly nature. This work cannot be done apart from Christ. It is not man-made or manufactured. This transformation and renovation comes when we let the Lord Jesus Christ rise up in our hearts. Uh, next week, uh, we'll talk about how we unpack God's gift to us by faith. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that you promised to complete a work in us until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you for strengthening us. Uh, thank you for renovating us. Thank you for uh, making all things new in our life, in our heart, our minds, our thoughts, our priorities, our values, our principles. Uh, we bless you for this transformation. And we praise God uh, that we are different from day to day. We thank you for that, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.